Okay. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate you all taking time out of your Mondays to be here. My name is Noelle Kalicki, and I'm an intern here at AAME, and I'm also a sibling of a young adult with Asperger's. Um, we've had panels before, but never one like this that's solely focused on sibling support. So this is the start of something new, and I'm really excited that it all came together. I'll introduce our four panelists. We have Jennifer Mitchell, Josh Mitchell, Scott Mitchell, and Jonathan Roth, as well as Jason Mitchell, the sibling of our Mitchell crew here, <laughs> who's going to jump in during our Q&A. Yes. Um, everyone here is here out of the goodness of their hearts with a real desire to support the sibling community, so I'm just going to take a seat and let them get started. Our first speaker will be Jennifer. Okay. So, my name's Jen. My brother, Jason, he's 23, Scott's 22, I'm 21, and then my mom had to take a break, have Josh at 17. <laughs> so having a brother with autism, it's taught me a lot, mostly, I think, just awareness of others from like a very young age. Um, in elementary school, in kindergarten, there was a kid who had autism, and I was in the same class as him from kindergarten to fifth grade, like every single year, just to be like his buddy and help him out with different assignments and just socializing with other people like I've just always had an awareness of people with differences and I've always wanted to be there to help them feel comfortable like I've just always noticed it um, another thing is acceptance like I've always accepted people with different views or different beliefs or different ways of handling situations like I've always wanted to hear people's different opinions and concerns and I've just always really liked hearing other people's opinions, and also patience. I work at a camp, I'm a lifeguard, and there's autistic kids, and you have to have patience, but not only with them, also with like the kids with just behavioral issues, the kids that are lonely, the kids that are like, less popular, like, whoa. Um, another thing about growing up with Jason, especially being the only girl, I feel like I always was bossier, so I try to find the line between being more of a sister relationship instead of like a motherly, bossy relationship. So when we were younger, we grew up at the camp that I work at now. And I remember like if his pants were hanging too low or if he was like swaying or bobbing, I always want to like tell him like, Jason, like, get it together or don't talk like that or pull up your pants, but I didn't want to seem too bossy. I always wanted to have like a sister kind of relationship with him. So over the years, I've like worked on being able to help him and give him guidance when he needs it, but knowing my position as a sister to just be there to support him and give him advice when he needs advice. Um, another big thing, again, is just how open and accepting my family is about ha him having autism. It was never a secret, so whenever my friends came over, um, some of them would ask me, like, they would see Jason, like, swaying and be like, they would just give a look. Some of them would ask, but most of them just give like a look. I'm like, oh, he has autism. A lot of them don't really know what that is. So I just say, like, he's very school smart. Like, he can tell you anything about history, about movies, about television, about animals. But, like, talking to people in person or having friends or making phone calls, like, is not in his area. And they're fine with it. They accept it. And usually Jason takes a while to warm up to my friends, but my best friends have been around for, like, five, ten years, and they'll hang out with him, like, in the cafeteria back at high school, they would hang out with him. One of my best friends actually goes to the same college as he went to, and she would, like, find him in his dorm room and, like, go out to lunch with him, just to make sure that he still gets, like, some social time, he's not just in his dorm room. So I think it really helped that my family was so open. So all my friends also were always there to support Jason. Um, another thing, I have, like, a tattoo now, so a lot of people ask me about my tattoo. And I tell them it's for autism, or they'll tell me their own story because they recognize the autism we're in as symbol. So I just, I love that we're so open about it and just, we, everyone will share their stories, and I like to share my story. Um, and then another thing, the future with Jason, I think we're all going to end up back around Massachusetts area. We're all going to stick together, and like, he'll either live with me, or Scott, or Josh. Or even on his own eventually, but I think once we all graduate from college, like, start settling down and getting a house, he'll definitely, like, we're all 100% for having him live with us. And he'll be like, Uncle Jay, and 
be the best uncle and babysitter, or he might find his own wife, have kids, but we're always going to be really, really, really tight. Yeah. I think that's it. Okay, so my turn. So I'm 17, so he's six years older than me, and I've been the baby of the family. I got most attention. These two would fight over me all the time. And so I've always been the last one to do everything. So they would do everything. They would be the guinea pigs, and then they'd teach me how to do it. I'd be able to do it easy because they'd help me through the process. But for him having Asperger's, I did do some things before him. I got my license first. And so there was this one time he was working, and I had to go pick him up from work and drive him home. And like I thought, like, it was awkward at first because like I'm the younger one picking up my older brother. But I got used to it, and like it was fine. And I've had jobs, like, and I've got money, and I have independence. I can drive myself there. I can go pick up dinner if I wanted to. I can go out. So like I've had like independence, and I've learned that like it's harder for him to have it, and like it's just easier for me, even though I'm the youngest. And so I always got all the attention. Then lately, since he's been in college, he needs some help with his homework and stuff. And I'm still in high school, and so he's been getting more attention. <laughs> so sometimes I got jealous, and I'd be like, Mom, I'm helping you with my homework. Pay attention to me. But I've learned to cope and become more independent, because I've seen him like just be brave and go to panels and talk in front of people. And he's just taught me like how to be independent and do stuff on my own. And with my friends, so my friends would come over, and I gotta admit, my friends are pretty weird. They're, uh, they do some, some weird stuff. So they're, they're weirder than Jason. They're weirder than Jason. <laughs> so like me, they were never taught like a formal discussion with my parents that he has Asperger's and he's different. Like I just learned over time. So they would come in and they'd, they'd hug him. They'd say, hey, what's up? They'd play with him. And then like when he went off by himself and needed like, what is it called? Alone time. They were like, oh, that's fine. Oh, that's fine. He can be alone, I understand, like he needs alone time. And so like they just learned, like through me playing with him, they learned how to play with him. Even though I never told them that he has Asperger's. And so, um, yes, they would always come over, they'd hug him and be weird, and like we played kickball out in the street, and he would come and like he'd kick funny, and like they learned not to laugh at him, they actually like helped him play because like, they saw me helping him play. And then the most important thing that Jason's taught me is to be proud of yourself and who you are and your differences and to be brave. I went through years where I was afraid to order pizza on the phone because I didn't like talking to other people on the phone. And so I'd say, Jason, can you do it? And like autistic kids, you know, they usually have trouble talking to other people. And he would just pick up the phone and call it for me because he was the bravest person ever. And he would get up in front of people and talk. and like. He just taught me to be brave, be proud of my differences, and I love my brother. So, my name is Scott Mitchell, I'm 22 years old, and Jason and I have basically been together since day one. Uh, we've always shared a room, even today we still share a room, except like I went off to college and stuff and like lived at college, but up until then we've always been together and have the same room. So just being together all the time, it's kind of just taught me to be more protective of him and kind of kind of like what Jen was saying, said like not so much the motherly stuff, more so just making sure like he doesn't get bullied or picked on or any of that. But he actually gave me a very easy job because I always thought like you see other kids with other special needs, sometimes they'll get picked on or stuff like that. And Jason just never really got picked on. Uh, actually, one story is one time me and him were walking down the hallway and um, this was in high school, and we had like some of the basketball team walking down the other way, and like the like the popular kids and stuff like that. And they go, oh yo, what's up, Jason? And then, like give him a dap and all that stuff. And then I'm just standing there like all confused because I can imagine like I'm like, well, how'd you know them? He goes, oh yeah, he's in my Spanish class. Yeah, we're cool. We're we're really cool together. And just like not having to really worry about um really watching out for him. It's made my job a lot easier. But I was always just there just to make sure like he would never get bullied. Um, uh, what's this? 
the one time though that I didn't really feel like I was the older brother was when we were younger. Uh, we were just messing around, just teasing each other or something like that. And usually I could like tease him and then run away, tease him, run away. One time he caught me and he grew a lot bigger than I did when I was like when we were young and he just grabbed me by the neck and just held me all the way up there and it was scary, so that was the last time I ever made fun of Jason. <laughs> we've always been we've always been cool ever since then. That was back when we were like five years old or something like that. But um also, just by being with him all the time, I realized that sometimes he likes to have his alone time since like, we're always together, so I always give him his space every once in a while. And again, back in high school, sometimes we would have the same lunch period. So I would be over here with my friends, and Jason usually liked to have lunch by himself. So every once in a while, though, I'd always like, walk by him and ask him if he wants to come over and hang out with my friends. A lot of my friends still knew him and all that stuff. But so there was actually a couple of times he did come over and hang out with us. and. It was fine, it was normal, but I could just tell he felt uncomfortable that he wanted to have his own alone time. So usually you would think like you would have to be nice and try to include him, but I realized that he's more comfortable doing his own thing. So it's kind of like being able to learn and like understand when he wants to be alone and when to actually include him and stuff. So learning that was very important for me. Um, uh, when I went off to college, uh, Jason started off at a community college he did three years there, and then he was going to be moving to Bridgewater State and actually lived there on campus and stuff. So before that, uh, my mom and I, my parents, thought that it would be a good idea to bring Jason up to my school and just to kind of like get the college life experience. So like one thing that we were doing was I like brought him up, gave him a tour around the school, showed him around, showed him like where we eat and all that type of stuff, all that. But then after, you know, I should get brought him to like a college party and just like made sure you got like in like kind of used to like that sort of environment but since Jason doesn't drink I gave him like a water bottle and said hey just like take little sips of this every now and then just like to kind of like pretend to fit in and Jason at one point said hey should I yell out hey the cops are coming I'm like no <laughs> do not do that so it was it was fun it was fun for both of us just to see the stuff that he did right, see the stuff that he did wrong. We were playing Pong and stuff, and he just fit in perfectly. Like, my friends every once in a while like, came over um, and, like, introduced himself, and I kind of already told them a little bit about Jason, that he has Asperger's and that a little bit socially awkward, but right off the bat, he just did what he always does, and he always gives a good first impression and just, uh, just makes everyone else feel good about themselves. So kind of going off that is um, my friends, same as what they were kind of saying, is that like my house has always like been the house where everyone always wants to go. So I'd constantly, all three of us, we'd constantly have friends running in and out of the house, always saying hi to Jason. Jason was always saying hi to all of them. He knew all their names. They'd always say, how you doing, all that type of stuff. Um, and like I said about like getting, in, getting him involved in what we're doing, sometimes me and my friends, we just grab some pillows, run into his area and just start beating the crap out of him with pillows, and we run out and he chases us, but then after he like goes and does his own thing again. So learning when to give him his own alone time is very important. Um, my friends, they always, they never felt like they had to say hi to Jason or talk to him. They just felt the need that they really, really wanted to, because it kind of made them feel better about themselves by meeting Jason. And kind of like one of my quotes that I like to use that my mom actually likes to use whenever she goes and does talks with um, other parents with autism or other parents with kids with autism is that instead of teaching Jason how to be normal, he did a better job at teaching me how to be special. And I believe that's the same for anyone with some type of special need. And not even just Jason, but just meeting other people and just learning from them rather than trying to teach them has made me the person I am today. And I can't even, I can't even imagine who I'd be without Jason. And I believe it's the same for, for these two as well. Um, let's see. Oh, I guess one last thing is that my relationship with Jason's very, not very different, but definitely different than with these two because, like Jen was saying, she's become, well, she kind of acts like a little bit more protective, like the motherly figure. But as Jason and I have gotten older and he's starting to become more and more independent, um, I see him more as an equal rather than like my autistic brother. So there are times, even just last weekend, we were at a family party or something like that. And I was like joking around and saying something inappropriate to him. And Jen was like, oh, you can't say that, Jason. Like, that's, that's awful. Don't say that. And me and Jason talk like that all the time. Because I, I, I just picture him as like one of my buddies. 
and but I also know when like where to push it, like where what not to say and all that stuff and just learning the balance between what's appropriate and what's the right timing is very important. And um, yeah, so far twenty two years have been good. We've still got more, right? <laughs> <laughs> a lot more years. Um, yeah, so that's about it right there. Very nice. So I'm Jonathan. Uh, I actually have two brothers with Asperger's, but uh, I'll try to keep to one time the a lot of time and you know, not doubled up. <laughs> but uh, so uh, first of all, thanks to you to uh, Mitchell's for talking about their brother. He's sort of got me loosened up a little bit here, but it was also really cool to hear sort of you know their experiences because I feel like I certainly you know I. It was a lot of on-the-job learning, I felt like, of being a sort of brother with Asperger's, and, or brother of people with Asperger's, and it was sort of, you know, I think it's helpful to hear what other people have to say. I don't, you know, I don't know if I really have any expertise, but I guess I'll sort of just talk a little bit about the sort of experiences that I've had and sort of the challenges that I've faced in having a brother with Asperger's, and then also get into some of the really amazing stuff about them. Um, so the the first thing that that I've sort of discovered in the process of of dealing with my brother with Asperger's is that sometimes social concepts, which come sort of very naturally to me, are sort of very foreign to them and very difficult to explain in words. So, for instance, one of my brothers sort of has trouble with personal space issues, and so you know I try. He likes to have things explained sort of very concretely, and you know, in the process, I try and sort of help him out with that sort of stuff, but in the process of doing it, I realize that these things are actually much more complicated than I sort of, you know, expect them to be. So, you know, I say, personal space, okay, well, you're supposed to stay, you know, maybe an arm's length away from other people, but then you realize that there are all these exceptions. So, you know, when you hug someone, you don't stay uh, an arm's length away. So, you know, you add into these rules that you're trying to describe all these exceptions, but then it's like very easy to sort of miss things. So. You know, I'd be like, Benji, okay, when you hug someone, which you do occasionally, you can get closer, but otherwise you should stay that far away and not, you know, come into this bubble of other people. But then, like, he'll be an arm's length away, but, like, he'll swing like a stick, like, right next to my face, right? Which is, like, wasn't in the rules because the stick was close to me, not, you know, him being close to me. And so I sort of discovered that, you know, it's very helpful for him to sort of describe these things in sort of these sort of rigid ways, kind of like, sort of like you're programming a computer in a sense, but if anyone's ever programmed a computer knows there are like all these challenges and all these cases that you can't really think of. And so, you know, I try and do my best to sort of describe these things to my brothers, but that's definitely sort of a challenge to sort of get in their shoes to, you know, sort of think about these things in this way. And at the same time, I think that really helps me sort of appreciate the challenges that they face, that, you know, I'm so lucky to sort of have these, like, you naturally know, you know, how these things work, but that, you know, they sort of struggle with these things and I sort of try and be really sort of appreciative of, of the sort of challenges that they, that they face in that respect. Um, and then, as I sort of said, I'm, I'm no expert in this, so one thing I'd be interested to hear what other people think is that at some, sometimes I think it's helpful for them to sort of describe these things in these very rigid ways and, and sometimes I sort of feel like you know, maybe it would be better if they tried to sort of intuit it more. And, you know, instead of having all these, like, very long, complicated rules, try to sort of just observe what other people do or sort of try and develop some of the natural intuition that, that other people have. Um, and so I, that's one thing that I sort of struggle with and I'm not, I'm not sort of sure of the answer to. It takes a lot of patience. Uh, and it takes, yeah, so perfect segue there by Scott. Is the next thing I was going to say, which, like, sometimes it can be really frustrating sort of trying to deal with my brothers. So... My little brother tends to get very hyper a lot, especially sort of when his meds are wearing down towards the end of the day. And he likes sort of talking about like random like farm animals and stuff like that. So like he'll be like, you know, he'll come and he'll be like, hey Benji, what's up? And he'll be like, ostriches. And then, are you an ostrich? Like, you know, all this sort of random stuff. And it gets very frustrating. You know, you don't sort of know how to deal with that sort of sometimes. But I sort of I've sort of tried to learn to sort of put myself in like his shoes and think about, you know, how hard it is that, you know, he went out to school all day and like he tried his best not to say this stuff and now he's home somewhere where he's comfortable and, you know, he's like more able to sort of say these things. So I try and sort of be understanding of sort of the difficulties that he goes through throughout the day 
and sort of be, you know, comforting and make him feel, you know, comfortable at home and try to, like, you know, try to hang out with him just like, you know, I didn't, you know, none of that happened because I know he's not sort of trying to say that stuff and, like, I want him to feel like he's sort of accepted even if that sort of stuff makes it, like, harder for him to deal with other people, like, when he's in school and stuff like that. Um, and then, sort of related to that, sometimes I find that it's sort of, in some sense, it's a little bit difficult to hang out with them sometimes because both my brothers are sort of a little bit one-dimensional. So my older brother is actually just finished rabbinical school, and he's very into sort of Judaism and Jewish texts and stuff like that. But if you try and talk to him about other stuff, sometimes it's a little bit difficult. And so I sort of I try to relate through him to him through the like Jewish stuff. So I like once a week we have a, he lives in New York, but once a week we have like a a phone call conversation where we sort of learn some some text. Um, but then I sort of, I try to sort of branch out from that into other things to sort of expand sort of, you know, his like social horizon. So I asked him like Saturday is sort of the, the Sabbath when a lot of people tend to like get together and have meals and stuff. So I sort of, you know, what are you doing for the Sabbath on Friday night? What are you doing on Saturday? And sort of get into other stuff about how he's dealing with other people and how he's sort of interacting with the wider world through that. Um, and I try and do the same thing with my little brother, who's sort of not religious at all, but science and engineering is kind of his religion, and, you know, he loves building stuff and stuff like that, so I, I try and relate to him, you know, via that, but also, again, try and sort of branch out to, you know, are you hanging out with the kids on your robotics team, you know, what are you, you know, maybe there's like a pool party you can go to with your robotics team and stuff like that. Um, and then just into the positive stuff, um, you know, they're both sort of really brilliant and I really appreciate, you know, I can never be an expert in like Jewish liturgical poems like my older brother or in, you know, my little brother, you know, we like our dishwasher, like the, the drawers kept on like, they, it's on like a little bit of a slant so the drawers like always like rolling out and he like rigged up this like rubber band thing that hangs on like the counter and you know keeps it in the drawer, drawer and I would never like in my life have thought of like you know anything that I could do like that and let alone like such a like clever way of, of doing it um, and then both of them are like sort of very moral and principled so you know when they have something that they want to get up for in the morning be it an engineering competition or you know a Jewish service or something you know they set their alarms they get like nine and a half hours of sleep they're like good to go in the morning and meanwhile I'm like on Facebook until like you know two in the morning and I wake up and I'm like really tired in the morning so you know their sort of like commitment to the things that they love is like super inspiring um, and then like sort of Jen was saying, just like my understanding of other people that I also worked as a camp counselor and like a special needs bunk when I was in high school and it just gave me, I realized that for my brothers I had like so much more compassion for other people and sort of the ability to understand and sort of try and put myself in other people's shoes and sort of relate to, uh, to what they're doing. So. Since Jason and I shared a room, we were always together, like, well, always. 
So I guess maybe I really started to like understand it probably when I started kindergarten because then I got to hang out with other kids and get to meet other kids and see what they're like because until then it was mostly just us three just like hanging out in the house doing whatever and I could tell like he did things differently than I did or he was very like sometimes he would watch I forget what the movie was but he would like watch the same movie every single day it's like the rescuers or whatever some days, yeah. so he, or like he would have, have his dinosaur set in, he would just like break out the dinosaur set and have it exactly aligned, play with it, and then put it all the way back and then do the same exact thing to, uh, the next day. So I guess I kind of just learned over time just because we were always hanging out together. It wasn't really like a, like a, like it just happened, like I understood. It just like gradually kind of happened. Um, just to add to that, um, I was officially diagnosed at the end of first grade in the second grade, so I would have been around seven. So Scott would have been six, Jenna five, and Josh wasn't even born yet. Been one. He would have been one. one. <laughs> <laughs> so they, I think they learned a lot more through experience and just day-to-day -day life rather than like you would in a textbook or something. I think definitely in school. Right, I mean, they definitely brought it up. They definitely did a lot of reports on it in school for like science health class and it's kind of different because you know it, I forget where it's written but the saying is that once you've met one person with Asperger's you've met one person with Asperger's so I might be different from uh, other people they know like uh, the um, person on the spectrum that my sister might have mentored or my brother might have mentored so yeah it was just kind of learning um, being with me day to day. That's how they, I think that's how they really understood it. Yeah, I'd add to that that um, I think it was sort of a gradual process for me, sort of, I mean, I think I understand, understood fairly early that there was something sort of different about my brothers, but sort of having the maturity to be able to deal with it was sort of a different matter. Um, I think when I was like younger, I was like, I was fairly good at dealing with my brothers like when I was home and it was just me and them but then like when I was at school and like they would do something like inappropriate on the bus or whatever like when I was younger like I felt like embarrassed and like was sort of trying to distance myself from them or like showed that you know like that's not who I am whereas like now I'm like much more like this is my brother this is who he is you know I'm just going to try and help him like you know wherever he is um, so that's that's something that develops over time and I think like you know I would say like Try and be as supportive of your kid as you can, and like make him know that like it's okay that like he has a brother with Asperger's. Like it's you know, it doesn't make him not cool that like his brother had that. Do you remember what at what age your parents may have mentioned Asperger's or autism, or was it is I think it just it was part of the right background? Around when he was diagnosed, right? They, they tried to sit us down. They said the fear was down because Josh was still a wee little baby. So they can't really sit them down, but they sat the three of us down, and because they wanted them to know as well as me, and uh, they uh, got out a couple of books about with like um, protagonists with Asperger's, and they just kind of said, "So Jason, you have this. Scott and, Jay Scott and Jen, your brother has this. This is what it's like. This is so it's like this and that." And I think from the far most most part, we, they, we all got it. Um, I think I might have got it a little bit differently because I just accepted that it was part of me, so I wanted to tell everyone, but they had to rein me in and say, no, you shouldn't be so open about it. You know, there are people that just won't get it, so be kind of selective about who you open up to. Kind of going off that, we also, just in our family in the town that we're from, it's just very diverse. Like, um, we have, like, a Dominican uncle. My mom has, in her family, she has, like, two adopted siblings. So just kind of going off that, when our parents told us what autism was and, like, that Jason has autism, we were kind of just like, but he's still Jason. Like, we just kind of, like, saw him for Jason, not, not saw him as, like, a person with autism. Just like we would see, like, a person of this race or a person of this gender, like, as just who they are. I also think when they told us that he has autism, it was just like a name for something that we already knew. Like we already knew, like it was just a word to put to it. So, not that it just helped us explain to other people once we got older yeah, if they wanted to know. know. Yeah. I have a question. 
Um, first of all, I'd like to say that I commend you all for being so supportive of your brothers. It's, it's really amazing and it's a blessing and not every person on the spectrum has such supportive uh, siblings. Mm -hmm. So, thanks. Thanks. good job. Um, I'm sure at some point in your lives you've experienced um, a meltdown from your siblings. And I just was wondering how, um, you know, probably maybe when you were younger or even now, like how do you react to that and how does that, um, did, did you have a helpless feeling? Did you feel like there was something you could do? Was it something that kind of like totally confused you? Is it, I, I'm just wondering your reaction. I feel like a lot when I, I'm the only sister and I try to take like that motherly, yeah. we could like kind of clash. So I definitely learned to let my mom handle it, like, especially some of his meltdowns, like, I knew to step away, like, I just learned not to talk, like, just close my mouth. Others, like, he would talk to my mom, other times, he just had to be in his room, like, alone, just have his own time. And he was good at being able to calm himself down. Right, I was, I kind of am, but I always was kind of very private, so mm -hmm. I don't really know how much experience they had with, like, meltdowns, because, uh, I mean, I'm seen them and didn't get involved. Right. You know, I was very private about it, or I would just do it with my parents, because mm -hmm. it was mostly a privacy thing, like, not like privacy, like, ooh, I don't want them to know, just because, oh, that's, how, that's just who I am. I'm private, I like to keep to myself, which means I internalize a lot. Yeah, so, kind of, yeah, so we knew that Jason likes his alone time a lot more, so I think like, when he had a meltdown or something that upset him, we would mostly give him his own space, give him his own time to kind of deal with it, because um, just by being in his presence or trying to fix it, just I would feel like that would just annoy him more. Just like with any of that, kind of like, well, not really with anyone, but like there, just like with some other people that if they're having a meltdown, you can just make it worse just by being in the presence. Sometimes people just need to go off and do their own thing. And that's mostly just how Jason dealt with a lot of his meltdowns or just frustration. Um, I don't know if I have a great answer for you. I've certainly dealt with a lot of meltdowns. I don't know if I've done it in sort of the best way possible. Um, I, I think what a lot of what they said sort of rings true about it, just sort of letting them sort of air out that I find that you know, if, if they're in sort of meltdown mode, that there's not a lot of, you know, rational talk that can sort of get them out of it, and that they're often much, much have a much stronger perspective once they sort of calm down a little bit and, you know, sort of thought about sort of what it is that, you know, you're saying, or, or that sort of, whether it was actually really important what they sort of got ticked off about. Um, but at the same time, it's definitely sometimes hard to, you know, do that in the moment. So one anecdote is that, you know, my little brother, he's very particular about sort of the orientation of things in like the den in our house. So that's where he likes to watch TV and relax and he likes, you know, all the stuff to be very tidy. The fan has to be in exactly this place in the corner and the couch pillows, when he comes in, he smacks them like a few times to make sure they're, you know, exactly upright and everything has to be like very clean. The carpet has to all go in sort of one orientation and not be sort of swept back the other way, and then occasionally I will come in there and sort of not sort of think about these sort of orientations of carpet, fi carpet fibers and, you know, the like, whether my laptop is sort of like a 90 degree angle from the wall, and so sometimes he'll get very upset about this stuff, and, you know, I'll go to the bathroom, and all of a sudden my laptop will, and my shoes will have been thrown out of the room, and it's like, you know, very difficult to sort of keep yourself, you know, calm, let him cool down on his own when, you know, it sort of feels like you're being attacked, but I've sort of kind of learned over time that sort of, you know, fighting back often sort of escalates the, the tension, but at the same time, like, you don't want to just give in to sort of everything that, that he wants, so I find that you sort of make, like, your initial case, like, you state your case, and then if he, like, sort of freaks out, try and kind of back off a little bit, and then later he usually either comes to me or often he'll like text me because that's easier for him and say, I'm so sorry, you know, like I realize that you have like space also and like in the future I'll try and be sort of more, uh, you know, appreciative of that or whatever. Um, so I think a lot of the times progress is sort of made afterwards, but in the heat of the moment it's sometimes difficult to be like, you know, get yourself into sort of that composure. It's 
it's very impressive to listen to you, how positive and, and healthy your relationships are with, with your brothers. Um, I'm just wondering, did, did you have any, uh, you haven't mentioned getting any professional help along the way. I'm just wondering, was, was there professional help introduced to as you were growing up in terms of dealing with the situation? Like he had his own group there. Right. We had one. Yeah, we never really had like a group therapy thing. Um, I mean, they had, and they occasionally had therapy. Just you know, it was like really things, things like really hard stuff to deal with. But I just had my own uh, therapy. You know, I mean, there was one time where I was like younger, and this group therapy program I had was having a sibling day. And uh, I remember feeling a bit unsure because I'm like, oh man, this is my thing, and now I'm bringing my siblings in, and what if the two don't really mix well? Like, what if they don't understand uh, the kids I, I've been to, uh, close with, or the kids I'm close with don't understand my siblings? And I think it was just fine. You know, like, they got it. Um, the other kids didn't really make a big deal of it. But, um, yeah, mostly we just talk to our parents when we want to like uh, understand stuff. But um, it was a, a lot of the understanding just came from living. Well, the big part is that my mom does a ton of work with like autism. She's a social worker. She does like, that's her like profession. So she's always like she's read a ton of books. She's done a ton of like conferences. Like she really understands Jason especially really well and like how to we've all just dealt with it so well mostly because of her like whenever we have a question or frustration we can talk to her and she gives us like a good like open view of it all and our dad <laughs> <laughs> um both my brothers have had their own sort of psychological psychological psychiatric help um I haven't worked much sort of in tandem with them. I, I had like once or twice sort of conferenced in with one of my brother's sort of psychologists because, you know, I was giving him sort of a lot of social feedback and so it was the psychologist um, to sort of try and coordinate. Um, but to be honest, I didn't find it particularly helpful. Um, I, my, my sort of experience with it was that, I, I don't know, I sort of felt like the psychologist sees him like you know, once every week or two, and that, you know, he kind of deposes himself together for the psychologist, and so I wasn't sure that the psychologist really sort of sees the same kind of stuff that, you know, we see sort of on a daily basis living with him, and so I sort of felt like, I don't know, I mean, I'm obviously not, I'm not a psychologist, and like, I don't have any sort of professional training in it, but I did, I, I sort of, I didn't, I didn't feel like we were coming from the same perspective where there was like, you know, I really got a lot of helpful feedback out of it, but I mean, maybe with a different psychologist or a different person that, that it could be very helpful. As Sir Jason said, once you know one person with Asperger's, you know literally one person with Asperger's and sort of, you know, each person's different. So. Well, my question is kind of, how do you find space in your own home for yourself that feels comfortable, especially when, I think it's more for you because um, of the family situation that, um, like when every, like when someone's feeling the need for everything to be just so, so that they can be calm, how do you find space for yourself in your own home? Like how are meal times? <laughs> like does everybody have to eat in a certain way so that this one person can stay in a room? <laughs> kind of thing that, the kind of things we deal with. How, uh, do you, how do you deal with that tension and that having to be just so? I feel like uh, what we kind of do is we'll just make adjustments to ourselves or to our lives because we already know that Jason has to make a million adjustments just to be able to live in this society. So I just kind of like having that mentality and just not being selfish, I guess. Not, not well, selfish is a strong word, but like if Jason wants to do something, if it's not too much to ask, we'll just do it. Because we know that Jason has to do a million other things that he doesn't want to do just because he has to do it. So it's kind of just 
thinking of my putting myself into his shoes and all the stuff, all the stuff that he has to do, all the things he has to be brave for, just helps us individually just get through anything that we don't want to do. Like if I'm too scared to do something, I think, oh, Jason just like gave a talk at something, or he, he just went through college, or he just did this, and I'm like, oh, I can do this, and this is easy. So just little things like that, I guess. That's just in the back of my mind. So that's just then having to practice that over and over again. It's just become like second nature, I guess. Great. And there's also a lot of compromise. Like growing up, I had a thing with um, like, uh, uh, what's, what's the right word? I'm like slurping the straws. Yeah. Yeah. That sound used to always really bother me. So everyone, by everyone I mean my siblings, we like have to uh, try hard not to like slurp their straws. But like, we did, we wanted to be close to your ear. <laughs> right, they, they do that. And I mean, eventually I grew out of it. Yeah, so I mean, I think growing up it was a lot of compromising, like you know, the slurping of the straws. Um, I think for me and my brother Scott, we, since we shared a room, we had certain things like um, I used to sleep with uh, our desk light on, and he uh, adapted to it. I used to put pillows in front of it so that way it wouldn't block, that way I could block me and still get him so I could right. sleep. We had the fan on. Right, and uh, you know, just like before, eventually I grew out of it, and uh, okay. now it's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit di uh, different because I like to sleep with a lot of dark, and um, I actually go to bed a lot earlier than uh, my brother, so he has a hard time, I guess, getting into bed because it's pitch black and he can't really see, so. He's got a lot of stub toes. <laughs> <laughs> right, and um, I also had a problem with, um, like, crossing crossing their legs when they sat. Um, I don't know why I had a problem with that, but I did, so, you know, we, again, it was all about compromise, so I'd be like, all right, don't look, don't look, don't look, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, just repeat myself again, eventually I grew out of it. So, yeah, growing up was, I think, a lot of compromising and, like, talking about, like, why do you feel this way? And it's like, I just feel like this. And they're like, all right, let me see what I can do. So that just kind of compromised. Uh, yeah, definitely a lot of compromise. Uh, I share I share a room with my little brother when I'm home. I'm grad student now, so I, I don't live at home most of the time. Uh, but my little brother, um, who I share a room with, doesn't like fresh air for whatever reason. So having the windows open is like, you know, upsets him. Whereas like I like fresh air, especially when it's hot outside. <laughs> um, so we like sort of alternate having the windows open and also an issue is that he needs to sort of make his bed perfectly every night before he goes to sleep and make sure sort of all the like crinks or little wrinkles are out of the bed and that his shorts are on straight so he like adjusts them like 12 or 13 times before they're sort of completely on straight and so if I'm asleep first and then he has the lights on and he's smoothing and adjusting, it sort of, you know, disrupts me, so we've sort of learned that if I'm going to sleep first, like, I'll let him know, Benji, I'm going to sleep now, and then he'll sort of come and make the bed beforehand so that the light can be on uh, for less time. But to also answer your question, I think growing up, you know, I had two brothers with Asperger's, is sort of a lot to handle sort of at once when you're growing up, so, I mean, I did spend a lot of time, like, at friends' houses or playing sports or whatever, where I sort of was was not around him to sort of, I felt like a sort of, you know, cathartic kind of break from the sort of stresses of that. And um, we have a few, oh, we have questions here. Um, how would you all uh, help, ex you all, uh, the, the siblings talk a bit about friends, mm -hmm. but I'm interested in hearing from all of you about how you help extended family or others who um, might not understand so well and might not be as inclined to be as supportive as you found yourselves being, how, how you incorporated attention and an understanding of your sibling for these other family members and, and others in, in your community? Um, again, I think it just like, it just kind of came natural. Jason's actually the oldest of our generation of kids, so he was like the firstborn. So everyone in the family kind of just like he was, I don't know, like he was the firstborn. Like, um, 
everyone kind of, I guess, like when he, when he finally got diagnosed or just by hanging around him, like you could tell something was different. And just working like with both my parents, they were just, like our family was just able to learn from them and learn just by hanging around Jason. A lot of it was just the more you hang around Jason, the more you would learn yourself rather than reading from a book or from like a professional or something like that. I learned so much more just by hanging with him than I know a lot more about autism just by hanging with him than I did from like reading anything or learning about anything. Um, yeah. I feel like we're lucky that uh, most of our extended family was really, really, really supportive of him. Like one of our aunts is a principal and she worked at school with a ton of special needs kids. So she's always been into it, but we've had family members that just don't understand it. And they're just, it's much more than just about Jason, but if they can't support Jason, we just don't want part of that. I don't know. If they can't accept him, he's such a big part of all of our lives. He made us all who we are that if they're not lucky enough to see how great he is, we don't need it. I think one of the nice things is that we sort of live in like a PC culture where like people try and be sort of accepting of other people with disabilities and especially people that like, you know, only deal with them on sort of an occasional basis are sort of able to, I think more able to sort of just be like, okay, if someone has special needs and possibly someone who, you know, is doing it all the time, there's sort of more of these sort of impositions on your like sort of regular life. Um, I've had sort of the unique experience of trying to get two brothers with Asperger's to sort of understand each other. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and that can sort of be an experience in and of itself because they sort of have their own worlds, like one has his like Judaism and sort of like one has his like science and it's sort of, I, I sort of try and bridge the gap but it's sometimes, you know, sort of difficult to make sort of one relate to the other. Um, but I try and sort of sort of get them to relate to, you know, help them relate to each other as much as possible. Um, and I think in some sense, each of them sort of likes the fact that they're like, their brother is like different in the sense that like, it sort of makes them feel good that, you know, they're not the only ones and they, but, but sometimes it gets to be a little bit counterproductive that, you know, like, one's like, well, I'm not crazy like the other one, and the other one's like, well, oh, look how crazy he is. So it's like, you know, I try and get them to not only, you know, like, not to be like, well, you're just as crazy, but, <laughs> but sort of get it to be, you know, more like positive rather than the two of them sort of, you know, butting heads with each other. Sounds a lot like our family. They all, just make, they all expose each other's flaws and just make fun of them. So. And I just have a couple of comments. So I know that I was diagnosed with Asperger's back in 1998. And um, for me, it was always very hard growing up because, like in my extended family, I was always seen as like an outsider. And it was only like two of my relatives ever really believed in me. And um, like within my own family, it's like my mother was the only one who was a really supportive one. I did have a sister, and she, she was originally supportive, but then as time went on, she, she then decided that I just was, wasn't really worth it. And, um, but I have to say that support for people with autism spectrum disorders has gotten better over the last few years, or as a few people from this place had told me, I was born a few years before the tide came in. <laughs> I have a kind of funny question. My brother's 54 and was only actually diagnosed as on the spectrum last year. He was diagnosed with many other things. But um, he's got a lot of skills. He's not as able as you, Jason, for example. But he loves Mountain Dew. And he drinks an unbelievable amount of Mountain Dew. And, you know, and he will not stop drinking it. He will not cut back. What do you do when your sibling is doing something he knows is really bad for him, and you know is really bad for him, and it's impacting his sleep, and he's complaining because he's not sleeping, and you can't do anything about it? That's why we only buy orange juice with pulp. If we get orange juice without pulp, it's gone. <laughs> I try to regulate myself because I like having uh, 
muffins for breakfast every day. For the past <laughs> 23 years. <laughs> yeah, so um, they'll like try to tell me to like try something else and I'll be like, all right, maybe I will or no, I don't really want to. And I think for the most part they're oh, pretty okay with it. But so again, it's a lot of that compromising. So like they compromise with the fact that I like to eat something um, every day. Um, I don't know, I don't think you three make a big deal about what I like to eat. I think, like, when he was younger, he had to have, like, a certain brand of muffins. And one day, we, like, ran out of it for some reason. And my mom, like, freaked out. She went to the store and she couldn't find it. But, like, over the years, he's learned to, like, accommodate. So instead of having just this one brand of muffin, he'll let have other brands as long as he has a muffin. But I feel like you can... He'll just like like to break him out of like a certain routine is really hard. Sippy cups. Oh, that's but, sippy cups. Yeah, he used to also drink out of sippy cups forever. But you can break a routine. It's just I don't. How did we like get you out of the routine? I think I just grew out of it. Like I think every. <laughs> uh, we had a force. <laughs> <laughs> Throw all the sippy cups in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think um, my parents just sat me down and said, "All right, you're in. I think it was sixth grade." Yeah, middle school, this has to stop, so I just stopped. Um, I don't think it was that easy, but you right, just have to take control. <laughs> Sometimes, take control. Right, I think what also happened is I got my retainers in, so I made drinking out of a sippy cup a lot more difficult. <laughs> so then that changed me over to using a glass. So. Uh, so I, I don't have a very good answer for you. If you, if you find out, let me know. Uh, <laughs> My older brother, when he was younger, basically only ate macaroni and cheese, I think. And like he has the healthier diet of my two brothers. <laughs> uh, so the older one kind of grew out of it. He's fairly okay now. The younger one, I don't know, he doesn't drink Mountain Dew, but like he drinks like a ridiculous amount of like iced tea and grape juice and then like he eats like yogurt for dinner sometimes or like he only ate burritos for dinner for a few months. He sort of cycles through like one food that he sort of constantly eats. Uh, so we've been trying to teach him about like sort of nutrition and portion control. Because portion portions, he sort of like, he drinks a cup of iced tea, but we have like these really tall like 24 ounce plastic cups that are, you know, <laughs> and he drinks like three of them. So it's really like nine <laughs> cups, not three cups. Uh, so I've been trying to sort of teach him about portion control, but, and sort of nutrition, but with sort of little success. So. If you figure it out, let me know. Hi, I have a question. Um, well, mine too. Um, I'm in college right now, and my brother is at home. And um, how is it? Has anything changed when you went away to, uh, to college? And just that dynamic. Since, since I've been away from college and I've been back home, I have a different set of independent skills. And my brother has, you know, his own set of skills, so, but I'm not sure where he is. I don't want to, like, enable him. Mm -hmm. So, <coughs> how did things change when you started becoming more independent versus your brother who made, you know, independent at his own level, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, well, I was the first one to go to college, but I took kind of a different path. Like, I started out uh, commuting to a community college because I didn't feel ready to do the whole dorm thing. So next would be my brother Scott, who's next oldest. Um, and uh, he was the first one to actually live and do the whole dorm thing in college. And uh, kind of a funny story behind that is um, I uh, had this um, paranoia fear that um, he was going to go off to college and I wasn't going to see him again because at the time he. Um, well, well, it's kind of both me and my sister were like teenagers, and they and in my um, perception, they didn't have a good relationship with my parents. You know, they were doing a lot of teenagey stuff, like fighting with my parents, arguing. I thought, oh man, they have a really crappy relationship with my parents. Am I ever going to see them again? And you know, eventually, you know, he went off to college, and my sister went off to college, and you know, I visited him he went up to me and she went down to Tampa, Florida, so I got to see my brother Scott a lot more often. So I saw him and we like kind of connected and I don't know, nothing really changed. I guess we kind of became closer because we both individually 
all, all of us individually had our own chance to like go off on our, on our own, go through that red passage and become men and women and, and like try to figure stuff out. Sorry. And um, I don't know, I guess we kind of became closer because, because you don't realize, it's kind of like that saying, you don't really know what you have until you don't have it anymore. So we didn't have, like we weren't like physically close for a lot of time, except during vacations. So when we got back together, it's like, I don't know, synergy. Like we can't, we're back together, we're reconnecting, and some stuff in us has changed emotionally. So I, I think we became a bit closer, and I had to learn that um, you know teenager stuff is teenager stuff, and you know my siblings can like grow and change, and you know just because they're like having a hard time now doesn't mean they're gonna have a hard time for like the rest of the time, and eventually they did come home. They they do come home, and uh, you know we're all doing all right. And I mean I didn't say and I uh, went to college eventually. I, Moving out to Bridgewater and do the dorm thing myself. And, you know, I got scooped through that right of passage. So, I mean, I guess when I was on my own, I mean, I still communicate a lot more often with my parents because, you know, they were the closest. But I would once in a while call my, my sister down in Tampa just to, like, check in and see how we're doing. And um, I came home on the weekend, so I still got to see my brother at his um, soccer games on Saturday, so I still stayed in contact with them, but I think we were at an age, emotionally, where we're like, we're all going to do our own thing, and we're going to try to figure stuff on, out on our own, so we all gave each other that space to like, find ourselves. I mean, I don't think you, anyone, you three, like, worried about me being off my own in college, you know. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did. Right, I mean, I kind of remember is that you all welcomed it. You're like, all right, you're doing this. Yeah, I was you're proud of you. I was definitely so nervous that you were going to be in your dorm room all alone every day. But you didn't. God, you were great. Seven grams a day. <laughs> <laughs> you did good. So, kind of going off that, when these two went off to college, he left. they left me and Jason home. So, we were both sad that they were gone. It was like different levels of sad. I knew that they were gonna come back in a couple months for vacation, but I'll, like he was paranoid that they would never come back. And so like I still had school every day. I had soccer, I had basketball, friends would come over. Like I still socialized all the time. For him, sometimes our family is the only social time that he gets. So like with these two out of the picture, all he has is me. I'm not around all the time. So like he loses a lot of his life. So when these two come back, the whole family's together, and we're all happy, and we all hang out together. And it's us, me, and our friends, too. Yeah, so when they're gone, their friends are gone. So it's just me and my friends. Sometimes I'm out, and just him. Those two are at work, so they just, he's alone, you know? Right. So that's why he gets paranoid. Alone, but not lonely. Like, yeah. like I said, I'm kind of a private person. I like to keep to myself. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I worry about my three siblings sometimes. I think it's because I'm the oldest. That's what older siblings are kind of supposed to do, at least what I think. I can relate, I think, to sort of what you were hinting at. Was there different routines when you come back? Is that... Uh... Well, like, you know, when you go to college, you learn to be more independent. Right. And when I came back, my brother was in a program, like, learning new skills. But I was not sure where he was. Like, when, like he never used to do laundry and now he does like I'm not sure where he is in terms of gaining his own independence like we're all trying to kind of do our own thing so I just kind of wanted to ask about that since when I came back he was like really jealous that I was away and living my own life and he was still at home and I felt really bad about that and just just getting the, like what do you do when you're apart and you have different routines and you come together and then you're not sure where the other is at and routines are important, that's the other thing, routines. Yeah, like, I'm trying important. to cheat him like he's an adult, you know what I mean? Like, I'm not, like, trying to do stuff for him. Like, I used to all the time. I used to worry about him constantly. I used to do, like, I used to, like, just do stuff for him, and now I'm trying to, like, make, let him just do things himself. So it's just, like, we're kind of making a new relationship as we become more independent, I guess. So. Right. Um, yeah.
Yeah, I mean, I think those are definitely things that I've certainly dealt with myself. Um, so, for instance, uh, one of my brothers got a new cell phone like a few months ago, and I'd sort of always sort of, you know, been like the IT guy of the family and sort of set everything up for everybody, but at the same time, like, I didn't, you know, I don't want to be setting up cell phones for the next, like, 50 years and, like, feel like he should probably, like, figure it out too, so I, like, sort of tried to get him to do it on his own, but then, you know, like, he kind of got stuck, and I was, like, you know, whatever, so I started doing it, do a little bit for him, but tried to at least make sure that he was there while I was doing it so that he could sort of at least maybe next time, you know, get farther on his own. Um, in terms of the leaving him alone thing, I can definitely relate to that because, like, I would come home from college and then, like, I'd want to hang out with my little brother, but then, like, I also had all these friends from high school that, like, I hadn't seen, you know, in, in like, four or five months, and, like, I'd be going out to them, and then he'd be like, well, why are you going out? And he'd be like, to see my friends, and he's like, well, my friends, you know, why don't my friends call me to go out on Saturday night or whatever? And it's, like, kind of sad, but, you know, I, I, I don't think you can sort of, you know, you can't spend your life just sort of relating to your sibling and not, you know, sort of having your own outside life, but at the same time, like, you obviously want to be there for them. So it's definitely a trade-off to try and sort of be there for them as much as you can, but also to sort of, you know, have your own way. I'm uh, still thinking on the uh, Mountain Dew and Muffins <laughs> situation here. My, my brother has definitely got some particular habits of routine, things that I feel like maybe he'll grow out of at some point, but probably not without maybe a little bit of pushing. Yeah. And I know that I probably don't have enough education on the topic, or I'm maybe too simplistic in views. But I honestly wonder, like, I mean, what happens if you just don't buy the Mountain Dew or don't buy the muffins? Yeah. For me, I'd be happy if my brother was just like, well, damn it, and he went out and got it himself. But I know he'd probably just be like, well, damn it, and then he'd just figure out something else to do. But I don't know if that's... To be something bad. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> like, I, I don't know how much is too much to push with those kind of things, you know? I guess, I don't know where you guys find the line and, and how much is appropriate for trying to help steer someone some way, you know? say, like, slowly ease into it. That's kind of like what we did for Jason for a couple different things. Um, so like he likes things that have like a really strong taste, like um, like orange juice that like, really gets him going, I guess, <laughs> or like some types of fruits. So we just or uh, any types of foods, so we kind of just tell him to do portions. He used to he always likes to have a fudgicle, so, but he used to have like two fudgicles, like after lunch and after dinner. So we uh, we compromise and say, okay, just one fudgicle for now. So he's gotten used to that, and now over time, that's just become part of his new routine. So we kind of like integrated that. Um, and yeah, I'd say just like slowly going to them. There's things like uh, the sippy cup thing, where he was like in sixth grade, still drinking out of like a sippy cup. So that one, we kind of just like told him like this is just something that that you need to change. Um, this is just something that you know, basically just need to change. Like this isn't what everyone else is doing. Um, it must. It was difficult. That one was a difficult one because it was something that you could had to just like change. Like suddenly you couldn't really have like a sip. Like, I don't know, just had to just change it. Um, I don't know exactly. My parents kind of dealt with this because we were at a young age, so I didn't really have to like, teach him that. But then just kind of being supportive and then seeing him with that, drinking out of a glass, like, oh, that's good, you're drinking out of a glass just like me or something like that. Just anything to try and boost up his confidence to be able to do it and switch it up a little bit. That's just kind of what, what's worked for Jason, I feel. I think old habits are like obviously the hardest to break, so. It honestly is just all gonna be his final decision. Like he, we can give him all this advice and try to push him or try to switch up things, but ultimately it has to be his decision to want to stop drinking Mountain Dew or drink less. Like he's not young enough that we just take away a sippy cup. Like he has to make the own decision. Like he has the ability to make that decision when he's ready to. Not going cold turkey on like drugs or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it can be equivalent to. Yeah. So. Uh, like I said, I haven't figured out the whole diet thing yet, uh, but I think the sort of self-motivation thing that they were talking about is really important. So like one of my brothers was sort of overweight and then got really motivated to not and started eating better and now he, he lost a lot of weight, when the other one is 
not yet motivated and sort of if you push against him he sort of pushes back twice as hard so if you tell him you know you can't just eat pizza bagels for dinner like that's not healthy then he's like well now I have this box of cookies and like if you keep on telling me what to do like I'm gonna eat all the cookies so like it's you know it's sort of you you try and like push one step forward and he pushes like two steps back so I think um, I guess sort of like what I said was sort of like the meltdowns. I think like I kind of you kind of have to plant the seed and then sort of you know get him to realize on his own that like he needs to do this. But I haven't quite gotten to that point yet, so I can't tell you if that works. But um, but I guess I take solace in the fact that when he decides that he's going to be healthy, he's going to like never eat a cookie again because like it's you know that kind of sort of very sort of. No one track, no exceptions type of type of person. So hopefully, if we get him on the right track, we'll sort of toe that line. So you know, we've we've got an eight-year-old and then two younger daughters, uh, and so I'm wondering about jealousy, uh, because you know, at, at five and two and a half, there's an awful lot of jealousy going on, mm -hmm. an awful lot of fighting. So I'm wondering, was there something in particular that helped you beyond just growing up and having a little more? emotional self-regulation yourself that you know, kind of get you past that and well, you move me, on. What's helpful? I never felt any type of jealousy towards Jason. I just think being the only girl out with three guys just made me jealous enough. You think I'd be like the princess of the family, but I was like the black sheep with all these guys wrestling. But I don't know. Jason, like, I just was never jealous towards Jason. I would actually go to Jason and to like just get my alone time to just chill and hang out with him would draw together, we would watch movies together. Right. I never felt like jealousy with you. Josh. I got jealous sometimes because yeah. I was in high school and I needed help from my mom with homework and projects and stuff. She was always with Jason, helping him through school, doing his homework. And then at night I'd be like, Mom, why don't you pay attention to me? Help me with my homework. She's like, oh, Jason just needs so much help. I realized that like I can do it by myself. I have no problem. I just had to so I need motivation. I just put my head to it, I can do it. He he's trying as hard as he can. He needs more help than I do. So I just I compromised. And I coped with it and I realized that he needs more help than I did. So jealousy went away. I guess kinda of like moving off to college, um, I gotta like see what life was like without having a uh, Jason as my roommate. So every time I had to come home though, Jason and I would still live together. And it was different because I'm used to like going out and like partying and all that type of stuff and like coming back and like doing my own thing. Like Jason likes to go to bed around like ten o'clock at the latest sometimes. Right. And he has like the fan on, he has the light going, he has the door, like everything like the way he likes it. So yeah, just compromise, like Josh was like, oh, we've said a million times. Um, so I would just come home and go back to his schedule and he would kind of just like learn from my schedule and we would just like find that balance right there. Um, but in terms of jealousy, I, I never really, I knew that he needed more attention or more help with stuff. I just kind of learned it just by watching him go day by day, doing his own thing. So I guess I just kind of learned that that's just the way it was and that sometimes like I will have to do stuff on my own so it kind of made me a little bit more independent. But not really, I didn't, I didn't really get jealous, not as jealous, because I just knew like he was doing so much that I can, I can deal with. I think also with jealousy, we each always had like our own thing. Like my thing was my dancing, Scott was gymnastics, Josh was soccer. Like we each had our own special thing that we got all this special attention for. So we all had our moments to like shine and like this was our day, and this was his day. Like we all had our each special I, thing. I kind of have a question. Was it ever the other way around? Were you ever jealous of us and how did you deal with it? Because I've never asked you this. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's just like small stuff. Like yeah. small stuff. Like, were you ever jealous that we were able to go drive out, and get ourselves food, or go hang out with our friends? Or I, did you understand, like, you I, don't want to do that? No, I got that. I wasn't ready to do that yet. I don't know if I really felt jealous because I always understood that we're all individuals. So, mm -hmm. I, if I ever felt like, oh, they're doing something different for me, it's like, well, yeah, I'm pretty much, I'm different already. So. Um, I'm just going to do my own thing because that's pretty much, I mean, I might be jealous of like um, clothes or 
I don't know. Small stuff. Right, that kind of small stuff, just like mm -hmm. regular sibling stuff. I, okay. I think I got jealous that someone that you are doing something before me. It's like I made that conscious decision that I wasn't ready yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever really felt jealous of the attention my brothers were getting. Uh, I don't know. It's just. It just started the way it always was, and I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think it really occurred to me until I was older that like sort of other people were getting more attention than I was. Uh, like, I remember like my parents used to spend a lot of time like helping my brothers with my homework, and like I was always a good student, so I basically just did it all on my own. And then like once like in high school, I was like driving the car with like a friend's parents, and the, her mom was asking like about all these papers that we had to write, and like what she was writing it on, like what I was writing it on. I was like, my parents don't know I have a paper signed. Like it, it, like it hadn't occurred to me until that point when I was in high school that there, like there could be like something else. Uh, so in terms of like feeling jealous, that just wasn't something that crossed my mind. Um, in terms of the jealousy, the other way, as I sort of mentioned in the response over there, like sometimes I think some of my brothers are like jealous of the fact that like sort of I have more typical like close friendships than they do and those things are sort of a little harder for them. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what the best way to sort of deal with that is. So one, one thing that I'll say and I think that Mitchell sort of talked about also is that kind of sharing friends. So like when I was younger like I used to have a lot of friends over and, and it, it was great that like my brother would kind of hang out with them. Um, I sort of feel a little bit bad when I was younger and didn't understand as well, kind of wanted to exclude my brother sometimes, but I think sort of, I guess, to answer your question, sort of encouraging the sort of friend sharing and sort of facilitating that might be helpful, but. I did feel jealous about these two sometimes, <clears throat> and I know they probably felt jealous about each other, just us three. Like if Jen got to go out, I'd be like, why can't I go out first, uh, vice versa. But whenever I came to Jason, all three of us, we never really felt jealous because we knew like, that's just the way it is. That might be him for a two-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They'll be jealous for a few years, but then they'll learn. Yeah. They'll get it. I'm not quite sure how to frame the question, but I'm thinking about like, empathy and perspective taking. I know we had a situation recently where my four-year-old like completely sliced his head open and spent the day in the ER. We picked you know, my eight-year-old up from camp, and all he could talk about was, I almost got poison ivy. You know, And it, the jealousy was the other way. And I don't know if you, and it was just, you know, I just, ah, it was really hard to watch one child scream, let me tell you what happened in my head, and the other child say, I can't listen because I almost got poison ivy. Um, so, you know, any thoughts on how you cope with that, or empathy or perspective taking in your experience, I guess? I think we've always just seen that some of our, like, things that we've conquered are bigger than other things. So like me, Josh, and Scott getting our permit wasn't as big of a deal, but like Jason getting it was a huge deal. And like, just this, like, I think we just understand each other so well that when we see each other accomplish something, like him graduating from school was a huge deal. Like we, everyone is just, some are comparable. Right. Just, and I kind of feel like it was the yeah, opposite. Like I was way too imperfect sometimes for my siblings, like I went through a phase where I was really nervous, terrified that they were gonna get kidnapped because I felt like they didn't have the same tools I did. I guess part of it's because uh, older brother thing. Like I'm older, I feel like be the protector. Really with vice versa. <laughs> right, but yeah. I mean yeah, yeah I, 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 want to I, I do feel like I was more a lot more empathetic to uh, my siblings to the point that I was almost over too overprotective. Um, that's what I felt like. It might have been a private thing that, you know, I kept inside and didn't really like, tell anyone. I think so. it was more of an anxiety of than you than you showed to other people. Right. I, don't, I guess I didn't really show anyone. It was a thing I mostly kept private because I've been saying this before. I'm a private person. I like my privacy. I think that sort of something I came to realize over time was that there are a lot of things that my brothers and Aspergers just don't get, and it's not that they're sort of, you know, malicious or self-centered or whatever it is that, you know, if a, like, neurotypical person, like, had that sort of behavior, you'd be like, oh, you're such a brat, but it's really that they just, it doesn't occur to them that that's something that they should sort of think about, and then once you sort of 
have that kind of understanding, which takes a long time to develop. Once you have that kind of understanding, then it's sort of a little bit easier to sort of deal with. So like the other night, like both all me and I and all my brothers were home for the weekend. Like my older brother was in from New York, who's not in that often. And so he needed to get a new computer, and I, as I mentioned, am the IT guy of the family. So I stayed home on Saturday night to sort of help him pick out the new computer rather than like going out with other friends. But then I was like doing most of the work with my mother to like pick out the computer, and he was just sitting there. So he was like, "Well, I'm obviously not needed." And then he like you know went off to do other things, which was like sort of felt kind of insulting because you know I'd sort of stayed around to sort of help him and at least wanted to like be around him. But I, you know, I came to it, you know, I've sort of come to realize over time that these are just things that like sort of don't occur to him. And so, you know, once I know that, then it's just, it is what it is. It's not sort of as, as insulting. And I think that to sort of that point, that when they do get it, I found that my brothers are like extremely empathetic and that they like, they see things a little bit like more black and white than most people do. And so when they see that it is black or it is white, they're like, very on board. So like my younger brother is uh, an engineering student and like in like one of the intro to engineering classes they do like this engineering code of ethics which like I'm pretty sure everyone else just like sleeps through for like an hour and then like never remembers that it was a thing but he's like very like you know into you know upholding the code of ethics that he has you know ascribed to as an engineer and it's like do engineering for good not for evil and like he's like very, he wants to be very sure that if he designs something it's safe and it like can't hurt anybody or like my laptop charger had like the insulation was coming off so it's like Benji do we have any electrical tape and he was like well like I'm not sure the electrical tape could withstand like the electricity in your laptop. And so, like, I have sworn to the code of ethics to, like, design things that are safe. And I, like, tell you, you need to take, like, the charger into, like, the Apple store and not just, like, wrap it up in this. But he's, like, very concerned about, like, other people's welfare and, like, when he understands it, making sure that, like, everything is, like, safe and, like, proper. I say a lot of, like, the head splitting open compared to the Boys Navi is that the Boys Navi's breaking a routine because it wasn't part of his daily routine to get Poison Ivy, yeah. whereas like, it's a lot easier for other people to kind of go away from their, your normal routine and do something else. But for, I know people, Jason, mostly when you were younger, but you've gotten much better, was that if you do, do something different than the routine, it was like the end of the world. So that's a, lot, a big thing to take into consideration, is that even though it could be the smallest little thing, if it breaks away from the routine, it's like the end of the world. Yeah. Well, I think that's my question about like, coming back, like when um, people come back to the house after going away to college, whole new routines have been set up, and um, whole new. And my son is learning a lot of new things. And uh, I think my his triplet sisters being away at college means that um, he wants to catch up, which is great because you know I've been kind of tra he's the kind of kid where you say. Where when he learned how to zip his jacket, the OT he said to the OT, "Don't tell my parents I know how to do that," because he wanted us to keep doing it for him. And and it's and I think that's the routine. It's like we always put his jacket on, we always zipped it for him, and then we walked out the door in a certain way, and that was a routine. So when um, since his sisters have been away. He's learned a whole lot of routines, and he's also learned a lot of skills because now he wants to keep up with them mm -hmm. instead of not letting me know that he can do something. So it's kind of, I thought the hardest times would be when he was home alone. Um, but it seems, and those can be hard times in our house, but it seems like sometimes when everybody's back in the house, it's a really hard time because suddenly we have like all these all this information that hasn't been passed about new skills learned, and people tend to mother him, having two sisters. Mm -hmm. you know, yeah. And and then uh, it's like suddenly there's all this noise and commotion in the house, and the house is like quiet, and the routines are totally different. It's, it's kind of hard. Yeah, with routines, we make sure that there are times where we break his routine, and there are times where we change what we're doing to help his routine. So 
Like, for instance, I come back from soccer practice. First place I go, I go into Jason's room, I turn off his TV, I push him around, or yell at him, or scream, or run around the house, or fight him, just to give him, like, break his routine, get away from what he's been doing for hours, and come play with me, so come get some social time. And then there's times where, like, I don't know, like, I change what I'm doing, and I'd set him up, and he'd be alone, and, like, I'd leave him alone so he'd have his alone time in his routine. And, like, if there's one muffin left, I'm not going to eat that muffin. It's his, <laughs> it's his routine, so I stay away even though I really want it. So, like, there are times where we want to break it, we want to take him out of his shell, come play with us. There are times where we want to keep him in his routine because it makes him happy. I'd say that, like, breaking routines that kind of just start stacking on top of each other. That once, because, like I said before, like, breaking routine could be, could be, like, the end of the world that sometimes. So like at a younger age, you haven't broken as many routines. So then as you start to break one, then you break another routine, and you start realizing that the end of the world hasn't happened yet. I can break a routine and still be able to go on with my day. So I feel like that one takes with a lot of time and a lot of practice to be able to start breaking routines and to start compromising and getting used to not following the same routine and to start going a little bit more with the flow. And that's one thing that we used to make fun of Jason about was tell him to be more flexible. You know? So he's become so much more flexible and to the point that sometimes I can just be like, hey, I was going to go see this movie, do you want to come see? And he was planning on watching like this on TV and then going to bed, but he'd be like, okay, yeah, sure, why not? So he'd come out and watch the movie with me. So just little things like that has gotten much better because in the past there was no way. He's like, oh, no, I'm supposed to go to bed and I need to do that. So just routines as you keep breaking them will just get easier and easier. Also, with becoming more independent, he started doing like no laundry. He started helping loading and unloading the dishwasher way before we ever did. I was the first one to learn. Just to prepare him just for life, because I don't. We just learned it going off to college. I learned to do the dishes. I learned to do my laundry. But he was always prepared. So once we left, he was still in his routine of helping out with the trash, helping out with the dishes, the laundry. So you were already gaining independence. We practiced. Yeah, making phone calls because you always have a hard time making phone calls. So we've worked on your independence. Yeah. Yeah, I've had sort of similar sort of experiences balancing sort of trying to push back on routines but also sort of acknowledging that they kind of need their routines to like, you know, relax and have their alone time as well. Um, so, but coming back from college definitely sort of set up sort of a clash of of routine. So as I mentioned, my little brother is very particular about sort of having the den his way and everything in sort of the right order. And when I was <coughs> gone in the middle, so he was alone, basically. So he basically had his, his way. And then I'd come home, and he'd tell me, well, you don't live here anymore, so you have no rights. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually kind of got him back a little bit, because this summer I was like between leases in Cambridge where I live and so I lived at home for a month and he's in school but he comes back on the weekend so he came back and like, you have no rights. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway so so because I had no rights like my stuff would get thrown around in the den and so I'd sort of like be like well you know I'm here now you know this is our family's house you know I have to sort of be able to be here also but then some of the time I could see that he's like really stressed out and like it really helps him to sort of have his alone time and watch TV so I'd sort of voluntarily sort of take my stuff out a lot of the time just to sort of help him along but I, I felt like it had to be that it was me voluntarily doing it as to me sort of being expelled. Um, in my family we're starting to make plans for when um, I, I'm not around, my, my kid's father's not around. Um, Jen, I know you mentioned that your family's considering living arrangements. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if there's anything that you would like to share um, about your thoughts about when, you know, the, the parents aren't around anymore. We've definitely thought about it and we're, we've all gone, well, he's got to go, but we're all going to graduate, we get our own apartment, our own house. And we don't want him alone, because he loves, he does love his alone time, but we don't want him like, in an apartment just alone every single day. Like, he needs someone to be there with him to be like, okay, Jason, let's go to a movie, let's go to lunch, let's do this. Sure. So I think you living with one of us is, like, a great start, and 
if you find a girlfriend or a wife or have right. kids, you guys can live with us, you guys can live on your own, but we're always going to be yeah. there to support you. We want you to have family around always. So. Right. I love it. Yeah, we already got the retirement plan. We yeah, have a lot of dreams in the future. Dreams. We can yeah, and open up our own breakfast when we're old men. But we're tired of playing. <laughs> <laughs> we, got, we got plans. Jason's on. Yeah, he's definitely. I've only lived with Jason for 22 years. Like that's all I know. So, I mean, I've gone to college stuff like that. And I've lived at college, but I wasn't like permanently there. I've always permanently been in Stoughton with him. So I, I wouldn't mind having Uncle Jay around and all that stuff. We have a dream to people. live in the suburbs. Live. Five minutes away from each other, so if he has his own house, he just come over our house, play with us, chill with us. Like we're always, always, always gonna be together, always. To be honest, I don't have it as well planned out as the breakfast. <laughs> 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 the muffin shack. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. My okay, mom's I'll here. Go. She's pretty healthy looking, so I. Don't know. <laughs> I'm hoping I don't have to think about it for a while. <laughs> you know, um, from listening to you, it sounds like like Jason and your brothers, um, you talk a lot about cooperation and um, you know compromise. Um, our son got diagnosed at 20, and. Um, their uh, com compromise is just almost like a dirty word to him. So you put that page out of the dictionary. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so I don't know. I think I heard you, one of you say that you worked at a camp with kids. Mm -hmm. Did you ever run into yeah, kids? We all did. We all worked at camp. I'm the boss. So <laughs> did you ever run into kids who were at late diagnosis that were having oh, yeah. a hard time with him? He's finally accepted the fact that he has Asperger's. It's taken almost three years, but. Um, very, very stubborn, very black and white, and uh, yeah. feels he has all the answers, and we should just butt out. Yeah, we met a few kids like that. Or yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I don't know, just by growing up, learning what Asperger's is, what autism is, and seeing that in school, just growing up, you see other kids, and you, like if I ever saw someone get picked on, like I would say something. Like Jen, and Josh, they would definitely say something. Um, you would never, none of us would really actually like join in and like make fun of them too. We would switch it around to make it see like, oh, he's doing a weird thing. That's a cool new weird thing. I got stories about stuff like that, but um, yeah, I mean, if compromise, like he doesn't want to compromise, I would say just practice. That's that's the number one thing that Jason's been doing since day one is just been practice, practice, practice. Because nothing's been easy the first time or the second time. It's gonna take like maybe the hundred and twentieth time. He's gotta keep going and pushing and pushing. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say. I mean, I don't know if you guys have if you guys have any other things. I think it's hard because as I've sort of touched on, I think a few times and in, in sort of from different angles that it's sometimes it's hard to know how long you should be playing tug of war for and you know when you should sort of let go and that you want to sort of push back on on routines that are sort of not healthy but you also you know you can't pull too hard because they do need like their space to relax or as I said when they sort of melt down they're you know it's no longer productive to push any harder but it's it's sort of it's a very fine line between when you need to be firm and when you you know sort of have to give up and I don't think I've quite figured out exactly where that line is. I don't think anyone's ever figured out where that line is. It's very, it's you have to pick a battle. It's a game of Jenga. As siblings, have you ever felt that um, you needed to not make waves or be good or really do really well in school or overachieve? Or you know, not bother your parents because maybe they had their hands full with your brothers. Uh, that you, you know, pressure to be the good one? I mean, kind of since I was um, the next born, I, like I said before, I kind of did feel like the older brother at times. So just because I felt like I had to protect Jason and all stuff, I kind of always had like a, like a burden on my back to try to be the best at everything I can do and just push myself, but um, I kind of used it in a positive way. I guess I used it to like really encourage and like, yeah, push myself. 
but then it also had a negative side where sometimes I would get way too anxious and really take the burden um, in a negative way and really um, just feel like this, that it's unfair that I have all this pressure and all this weight to really like be like the leader of the family type of thing. But then like it's the it was probably mostly just like being a teenager though too. It felt like the world wasn't fair and like blah blah blah, everything's against you. But like I kinda just like worked my way out of it. I know I never I never really blamed Jason ever for um any any ways that I felt because I knew that he had absolutely no no tie into it. He had he he didn't do anything on purpose. That's just who he is and that was just the way I was reacting. But it, it could also have been vice versa. Maybe he then felt the pressure that um, that he had to try to keep up with us or something like that. So I just think about it both ways and that if we just balance it out and just have no one have no pressure or anything like that, it would be much easier for both of us to work together to move forward. Mm -hmm. That's kind of just how I saw it. It's kind of like what you said earlier. Like he steps out of his comfort zone all the time. He's so brave and it pushes us to be more brave and do more things, try new things, and be better. So like his brave bravery affects us in a good way. You know, like he's never done anything where like I'm like jealous of him and I want to like take his spotlight. Like I don't feel like he's under the spotlight. Like with our parents. Like he just helps us a lot. I'd like to think I was just like really easygoing to begin with and that, you know, I uh I wasn't doing it for my brothers, but I, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't think I was like super motivated to like behave differently because you know they sort of needed more attention. I think that was just sort of just sort of the way it, way it was, the way things worked out that you don't really think about. Uh, but I think now, like as I'm older and have more perspective, that like it's very it's motivating to me that like I see like how much they struggle with sort of things that come very naturally to me and like how lucky I am to sort of have sort of those natural skills and it like motivates me to like work harder and, and sort of make the most of the, of the skills that I was given. Yeah, my parents always taught us like no one rules to always stay together. So even though like they were probably telling me to like watch out for Jason and to make sure like nothing bad happens, they would do the same exact thing for him. They would tell him to watch out for Scott to make sure nothing bad happens. So it did make us both feel like we were both in charge. Same with like both of them too. Like we were all told to watch out for each other. So if everyone's watching each other's backs, you don't really have to watch your own because you have enough support right there. That's just kind of like the way that we've been raised. And it's helped. So uh, like we've all been pushing ourselves, I guess. I'm constantly pushing this numb mode. <laughs> constantly pushing them. <laughs> We take a while to grow, too. <laughs> yeah. Take me a little while to get out of the comfort zone. Well, we had some questions posted on our Facebook page for you guys. Um, one of them was, when times were tense at home, what were your coping mechanisms, and what do you recommend? Like, when things were tense between your sibling and their parents, or just with your other siblings, I mean, what did you do to try to, you know, not carry the burden of the tension. Um, well, like I said before, I internalize a lot of things. So like when my siblings argued with my parents, um, I internalize it. Like I uh, catastrophize it a lot. Like I thought this is gonna, how long is this gonna be? Um, there was actually one time my sister had a pretty big fight with my parents and they were like yelling at each other for a long time and I tried to stay out of it until eventually my parents came to me and said Jason, your sister is having a really hard time, can you like walk with her outside? So yeah, I got dressed and I walked with her outside while she talked on her phone and I just stood there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really know what to do. I feel like I have a sensor when I'm with Jason and then just being with him calms me a lot down because I'm not going to throw all my problems that I have onto him. Like that's, again, he catastrophizes everything. So if I told him one thing, he's going to be like, she's going to run away and never come home. And so just being with him, like whenever I've had a problem with my brothers, my parents, like being with him is like another world to just chill out in his place. And if we, I don't think we, we never really argue. Like it's great that 
Jason never really argues with me or my brothers. Right. It's usually us between each other or us with our parents right. or you with our parents. Right. For some reason, I kind of really hold a grudge. Like, I'm really quick to apologize. Like, I mean, if something's bothering me, I don't even internalize it for that long. Like, I address it pretty quickly and then just let it go. Like, I guess as long as I have someone to, like, talk to, I can, like, get over it. Which is usually our mom. You don't really talk to us about your problems. Right. Major problems. Right. Like, it's just because I guess that's who I internalize with. I don't know. I've never really, like, talked to you about anything that's, like, really bothering me. Yeah. Like, really bothering me. Yeah. I mean, if it's a small thing, then, yeah, we can talk about it. But if it's, like, you know, really big things, then I mostly go to our parents. I think I had probably more conflict between me and my brothers than it sounds like the Mitch is at. I'm a little bit jealous, but uh, <laughs> I I think I had a really great group of friends. Still have a really great group of friends, and uh, like when I was growing up, and like it was difficult with my brothers. Like I'd hang out with my friends and play sports with my friends, and that was like sort of my release. Um, and I think it got a lot easier when I sort of like moved out for college and since then because I, I, I'm, you know, not confined in the same space 24-7 and so I sort of really appreciate the time that I have with my brothers because it's not as often but it's, it's a little bit more sort of manageable from a sort of stress type of thing. Do we have any more questions? Anyone else? Yeah, I Great. Well, I want to thank our panelists very much for coming out here. And <laughs> you guys were wonderful. And I also want to give a big thanks to Brenda Dater, our Director of Child and Teen Services, because without her support, this wouldn't have come together. So thank you very much to Brenda. <laughs> Feel free to come up.